a paper in no elementary number theory. Have you considered maybe like, I mean, I would imagine this is quite a popular topic, like cryptography or something like that. Speaking of applied math, there are some um, basic algorithms in cryptography, which are totally understandable from a number theory point of view. So I know that there was a guy that made a book. His name is William Stein. Uh, here, uh, elementary number theory. And uh, you can get it for free, totally legal. And one of the big things that's in this book is a description of public key cryptography, which uh, covers the, um, yeah, well, public key cryptography, which is based upon the difficulty, I believe, of factoring the products of large primes. Um, I don't know. This is a book intended for undergraduates. I would imagine that it um, starts off in a pretty elementary place. We can look at like prerequisites. The reader should know how to read and write mathematical proofs and know and must know the basics of groups, rings, and fields. Oh, okay. Thus, the prerequisites for this book are more than the prerequisites for most elementary number theory books. Here, here is that book that I was talking about, William Stein's uh, Elementary Number Theory. And it has a section on, in it on um, cryptography. This definitely isn't math, but how has the acquisition of a PhD impacted your social life or the way people in general see you? Um, it's a good question. I think, uh, I think what the reality is that people, there is a certain, um, level of respect for your intelligence that you automatically are granted once they know that you've gotten a PhD in mathematics. Um, and that can be a little bit intimidating for people. On the other hand, like at the same time, this is not, I'm not the greatest person to be reporting on this fact because I am also an extreme introvert and very bad at reciprocating basic social cues. <laughs> I'm actually totally terrible at it. I might recognize the social cues. I'm not like, uh, I'm not totally blind to them, but there are many things that the normies, the many rituals that the normies uh, uh, gladly partake in, which I have, as it happens, an allergy to. Yeah. It almost certainly is. They're a bunch of freaks. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a function of getting a PhD. It's more like a, um, a correlation, <laughs> uh, perhaps. I have really, yeah, I'm extremely introverted. I've got very, uh, I'm perhaps socially retarded. I'm, it does mean that sort of this people who can relate to you and the people that are become that do become good friends are people that are typically smart, which is a nice thing for most folk. There's a bit of a, I would say an initial intimidation. You know what I'm tempted to do right now? I'm sort of in the mood to do instead of the game. Con. All right. I'm in. What? I haven't. What grade am I in? Adult learner. That's me. What courses can we help you learn? 
This is all easy as fuck. Physics. Maybe electrical engineering. Biology? Economics? <laughs> I would like to see what they do in computer programming. Test prep. Life skills. Look, see, I've already done some of it, it seems like. What I want to do in... I don't know. Where does it get to the quizzes where they test me on the shit? I feel like I know what that is. Yeah, acceleration. I know what that is. Uh huh. This right here is a picture of an Airbus A380 aircraft. And I was curious, how long would it take this aircraft to take off? And I looked up its... Yeah, but are there um, quizzes that will give me gold stars uh, for Feynman's lectures? Let's say I have something... You get gold stars or maybe green check of... marks um, on Khan, Khan Academy. And it makes, it makes me feel good about myself. Here we go. I'm not sure that we absorbed any of the material there, but we're going to... Let's go. Let's try to do this quiz. Okay. So we have a time against position graph. What is the average speed of the swimmer between times t equal to zero and t equal to eight? Well, I think we do two minus zero. It's the slope of the secant line. Two minus zero divided by eight minus zero. So that feels like one fourth meters per second. <laughs> See, look, a gold star. I'm, I'm wrong. I was wrong. You get a green check mark and a gold star. Can Feynman give me a green, a green check mark and a gold star? I don't think so. A, t a lost bat flies forward and backward. Its motion is drawn on the following graph of horizontal position versus time. What is the instantaneous velocity at time t equal to 5? Pretty clearly 0. But it's too painful when you get something wrong to make the stars worth it. Wow. I relate to you. I feel like we are... Kindred spirits winning big forever. I really do. Because I know that, yeah, I know what you're talking about. What do you think? I think we can all agree. The instantaneous velocity of the bat is zero, right? We can agree. Let's check. I'm nervous. Here we go. Oh, we killed it. We killed it. Oh. Race car starts from rest and speeds up uniformly to the right until it reach a, reaches a maximum velocity of 60 meters per second in 15 seconds. What's the acceleration? I think it's 60, 60 divided by 15. I think it's 4 meters per second squared. What do you think? Well, we didn't get a check mark here. Unfortunate. A skittish squirrel is climbing vertically on a tree. Its motion is shown on the graph, on the following graph, a vertical motion, vertical position y versus time. What is the instantaneous speed of the squirrel at time t equal to 2? Well, so we need the slope of this line, don't we? And it looks like the units on this are the same as you. So I would say it's negative. Oh, instantaneous speed. So it's one. Oh, wait, what? I mean, it's negative one. This is a trick question. I don't know how to feel about this, but I'm, I'm going with this. Because isn't speed a scalar quantity? It shouldn't have a, a, a positive or a negative tag to it. 
Anyway, feeling confident. Okay, so whatever. What's the average velocity? Fine, fuck you. Okay, four and 10. So five minus two is three divided by six. Uh, it's one half meter per second. Positive. All right. Level down on one skill. I only got four or five correct. Whatever. I don't know how to try again. Um, a baby crawls toward a toy. What is the average speed of the baby between times t equal to zero and t equal to four? Well, travels one meter in four seconds, so 0.25 meters per second. Um, average velocity t, it's just the slope. So this is four, negative uh, one fourth. Um, average speed between times t equals zero and t equal to 10. So six minus five is one, or negative one, divided by 10. So negative one tenth. Oh, speed, they're trying to get me again. Wait, <laughs> um, is this the answer? Wait, what? Am I reading the graph wrong? Time t equal to 10. Wait, help me. What is the right answer? One meter, 10 seconds. What, what do they want? Wait, what? Am I going crazy? How is it 0.7? What is the average speed of the ant between the times t equals zero and t equals 10? Don't you take this minus this, that y coordinate here minus the y coordinate there, which is negative one, divided by the length of time, 10? Or is there something else about average speed that I don't understand? That's average velocity for sure. Is that different? So am I, I'm supposed to calculate the average speed along here, which would be six minus two. So for four seconds, it would be one meter per second. For three of those seconds, it would be zero meters per second. And then for two of those seconds, it looks like, um, what is this? Five minus two, three. Three halves meters per second. So then I do, um, for four seconds, I do four times one meter per second plus two times three halves meters per second divided by the total number of seconds that I'm doing this for, which ends up being 10. So this is four plus three, ah, seven divided by 10. This is what they want.
Okay. Next question. I feel comfortable with that. Average velocity times t equals zero and t equal twelve. So average velocity is zero. Okay. Um we're gonna try this again. Average speed between t equal to 4 and t equal to 12. So for this portion, it's 0. But from 8 seconds to 12 seconds, the it's uh, 2 meters per second. So 2 meters per second from here to there. So I do 4 times 2 meters per second. 4 seconds times 2 meters per second. And then I add to that um, 4 times 0, so I don't need to do that. And I just divide this by 8. So this should be 1 meter per second. <laughs> Fuck me. Wait, I divide by 8, right? It goes down 2 meters. Oh, it's 1 half meters. Is that what, what the issue is? 2 meters and 4 seconds. So it's really one half. Okay, whatever. Two eighth over eight, so it should be 0.25 meters per second. Okay. Average velocity, these are easy. Seven, so displacement is four, time is seven, four sevenths, which I'm guessing is this average speed between times t equals 0 and t equals 12 well speed here is 2 meters in 4 seconds so that's half of a meter per second and this is also half of a meter per second so for 8 of the seconds they're going at half of the meter per second so this is 4, and then we divide by 12. So I think that should be 0.33 meters per second. I'm getting it. I'm learning. What's the average velocity of the squirrel between times t equals 0 and t equals 10? So that looks like negative 1 tenth. Just making sure... Minus one divided by ten. All right, I'm proficient. Oh boy. Okay. What is the instantaneous velocity of the igu iguana? So essentially, that's the slope of this line, which is negative one. The sloth is climbing vertically on a vine. What is the instantaneous velocity of t equal to 8? So it looks like in one second it's climbing 3 meters. One second, 3 meters. So it should be positive 3 meters per second. Wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Two, uh, sorry, so this is three halves meters per second. I couldn't, I don't know how to read this. All right, we're doing good now. We're, we're in the groove. An ant climbs vertically on a fence. Its motion is shown on the following graph of vertical position versus time. What's the instantaneous speed of the ant at time t equal to eight? Didn't I just do this? Here, this is one and a half in one second. So again, it's 1.5 meters per second. Okay, one more. What's the instantaneous speed of the bird at zero? At t equals six, I mean, it's zero. Getting energies. I'm not sure what that means exactly. 
where do I try again? A uh, canoe is drifting left toward a hungry hippo with a velocity of seven meters per second. The canoe rider starts paddling frantically, causing the canoe to travel to the right with a constant acceleration of six meters per second squared. After four seconds, what's the velocity of the canoe? One. So basically, uh, 24 that way. 24 that away. So 17. What do you all think? <laughs> no, nobody's interacting. They're just watching me flail. I think it's 17. Because every second that passes by, the canoe gets more six, six additional meters per second to the right. So I think in the end it'll be traveling 17. All right. A bird is flying to the right when a gust of wind causes to the bird to accelerate leftward at 0.5 meters per second squared for three seconds. After the wind stops, the bird is flying to the right with a velocity of 2.5 meters per second. Assuming the acceleration from the wind is constant, what was the initial velocity of the bird? Uh, Well, I guess it would be four meters per second, right? Because every second it slows down by 0.5 meters per second. So I'm gonna guess four. An alligator swims to the left with a constant velocity of five meters per second. When the alligator sees a bird ahead, the alligator speeds up with constant acceleration three meters per second squared leftward, leftward until it reaches a final velocity of 35. Killing it. A bicyclist is riding to the left with a velocity of 14 meters per second. After a steady gust of wind that lasts three and a half seconds, the bicyclist is moving to the left with a velocity of 21 meters per second. Assuming the acceleration is constant, what is the acceleration of the bicyclist? Assume a coordinate system. Oh, see, this is where they try to get you. So you want to do 21 minus 14, which is 7, divided by 3.5, which is 2 meters per second squared. But the question is whether or not it's going to be a positive 2 or a negative 2. I think it should be a negative 2, right? If right word is positive. Nice. A rocket ship starts from rest and turns on its forward booster rockets, causing it to have a constant acceleration of four meters per second squared rightward. Rightward. After three seconds, what will be the velocity of the ship? Oh, 12 meters per second. Julia drinks, dr jumps straight upward on Mars, where the acceleration due to gravity is 3.7 meters per second squared downward. After three seconds, Julia is falling downward with a velocity of 3.1 meters per second. Assuming air resistance is negligible, what was the initial vertical velocity of Julia's jump? Uh, So wait, it, she, it must be negative then. Oh, upward is positive. 
Okay, so she must have jumped up and then came down uh, with this velocity, right? So, um, Her initial speed is negative 3.1. Or sorry, her initial speed, I don't know. V initial, V naught. Well, it's more complicated than that, right? Because it's not just... Well, I guess it's not that much more complicated, is it? Is constant acceleration. So V naught minus negative 3.1 divided by 3 seconds should be equal to negative 3.7, I think. Uh, there's something wrong with this, isn't there? Uh, hold on, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to go use the bathroom. How long do I think Libgen will be alive? I have no idea. Yeah, what I should just do is add to negative 3.1, add 3 times 3.7. Um, so 0. 0.6 plus 7.4 makes it seem like it's eight, which is what var epsilon said. Nice. Um, a speedy rabbit is hopping to the right with a velocity of four meters per second when it sees a carrot in the distance. The rabbit speeds up to its maximum velocity of 13 meters per second with a constant acceleration of two meters per second squared. How many seconds does it take for the rabbit to speed up from 4.0 to 13? So 9 divided by 2, right? So it should be 4.5 seconds. Awesome. I'm not, there are no more levels to reach, okay. But this is forever on my permanent record. Okay, 
Well, I'm just going to have to deal with it, I guess. Setting up problems with constant acceleration. A baseball is moving at a speed of 2.2 meters per second when it strikes the catcher's glove. The padding of the glove is compressed by 2.4 millimeters before the ball comes to a stop. We want to find the average acceleration of the baseball while it is compressing the glove. Which kinematic formula would be most useful to solve the target unknown, which is the average acceleration? Um, probably this one, right? Because we know that at the moment it hits the padding of the glove, we know that it's traveling at 2.2. Oh, actually, we don't know the time though, so maybe not. So what is this? V squared is equal to V naught squared plus two times the acceleration. I think it's maybe D. We know V naught. We know the final uh, velocity. We know the distance traveled, so we should be able to solve for A. I don't know. All right, we killed it. Hi, Make It Pies. How are you today? Today we're doing um, a Khan Academy. Khan Academy. Blind Khan Academy run. Let's write it like that. Oh no, sorry to hear it. A train is traveling at a speed of 80 kilometers per hour when the conductor applies the brakes. The train slows down with a constant acceleration of magnitude 0.5. We want to find the distance the train travels from the time the conductor applies the brakes until the train comes to a complete stop. What is the kinematic formula that would be most useful to solve for the target unknown. Um. <laughs> I really should probably review the, uh, I should probably watch the videos and stuff, but um, okay. V naught is 80, constant acceleration is 0.5, and it, it's this one again. We just, uh, now we're hunting for delta x. It's the same one. Okay, they're tricking me. What? Am I done? Wait, what just happened? Hi, Pabul. PB uh, PBLBS. I'm so confused. A bumblebee flying to the right when is is flying to a right when the bee breeze when a breeze causes the bee to slow down with a constant acceleration of 0.5 meters per second squared. After two seconds, the bee's speed is 2.75 meters per second to the right. How fast was the bumblebee flying before the breeze? Uh, 
uh, 3.75 meters per second. A jet boat is drifting with a speed of 5 meters per second to the right when the driver turns on the motor. The boat speeds up for 6 seconds with an acceleration of 4.0 meters per second squared leftward. What was the displacement uh -oh, of the boat from the position when the motor was turned on? Okay, so now I need to know one of those equations which relates distance with things. Well, so the final velocity, okay, so the in initial velocity, I have to actually uh, write things down now, oh my God. So let me um, tuck this up like this. Let's try to develop a formula for this. So what we know, what we can figure out is we know the boat's initial velocity. The boat's initial velocity is negative five meters per second because it's drifting Oh, I'm sorry, it's drifting to the right, so that's positive 5 meters per second. But then it has a final velocity at some point, which is, be, uh, which is different because this boat is accelerating, starting at time t equal to 0. And the final velocity is going to be, um, well, it goes for 6 seconds with an uh, acceleration of negative 4, so I should add negative 24 meters per second to this to get negative 19 meters per second. That's its final velocity, right? So the average velocity then would be VF, average velocity, would be uh, VF minus V naught divided by the uh, time it took to do this, which is six seconds. And so if we just take this average velocity, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not average velocity, is it? Um, the units on this are not right, because this is meters per second, that's meters per second. This is seconds. So this has units of meters. So what have I done wrong? The average velocity. Is negative 19 minus 5, negative 24. This is 4 meters? Oh, this is the average acceleration or something, right? This is not quite what I want. X equals X naught plus VT plus one half AT squared. Okay, um, this is not average velocity. This is average acceleration. Uh, 
Um, Do I just have to memorize that stupid thing? I mean, I know, I realize one could derive it from like basic stuff about like yeah. So like, uh, if you have a being equal to dv dt. Then what you know is that V is equal to AT, and so um, X is the antiderivative, or plus C, uh, plus the initial velocity, V naught. And then you can take the integral of this, so you get that X is equal to 1 half T squared plus V naught T plus X naught, which is what you wrote. Oh, and I missed an A though, my bad. I have to, I, do I have to memorize this? Okay, so X is the displacement. So then um, X is equal to one half the acceleration, which is negative four times T squared. So T squared is six squared plus v, <laughs> v naught t, which is um, 5. It's going right. So and right, word is, right is this way. Right is that way. So 5 times 6, I'm really nervous right now, plus its initial position, which I guess is 0. So that's... 16 that's 8 times are you kidding 36 that are going to make me do this plus 30 that's 240 plus 48 is that 288 plus 30 is this 318 i have no idea round the answer to two significant digits I don't know, did I mess up? 240 times six. Uh, two, 240 plus 48, right? I have no idea what I'm doing. Negative four. Oh, did I square something badly? I think I did. So this is um, negative two times 36 plus 30, which is negative 42, which makes sense. Are you sure? Negative four divided by two is negative two, negative 72 plus 30 equals negative 42. I have no idea. I can't I cannot decipher any of this. Okay? This looks really hard. I can't bear to look again. This has been a thing that's plagued me my whole life, but we're just gonna go with it, okay? Okay. We did it. Oh man, I have to memorize this dumb thing. A horse and rider are racing to the right with a speed of twenty one meters per second when they pass the finish line and begin slowing down. The horse slows for 52 meters with constant acceleration before it stops. What was the acceleration of the horse as it came to a stop? Whatever. Um, so I know, I guess I can use this guy again. So the horse slows for 52 meters. So 52 is equal to one half 
times the acceleration, which I would like to know the value of, times t squared. Oh, we don't know t squared. Or we don't know t. Oh no, we can figure it out though, right? No, no, no. We 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 can only figure out. Um, 21 meters per second, they start slowing down. The horse slows for 52 meters with constant acceleration before it stops. So its initial velocity is 21 meters per second. And then it's doing a constant slowdown before it stops. So its final velocity is zero. Its initial velocity is 21 and it takes 52 meters for it to do this Basically, you know 52 equals at squared over 2, and at equals 21 modulo sines. I am so confused. Fit, okay, wow, yeah, physics is hard. Hey, I use this formula. I use this formula then I get that um, oops sorry about that um, x naught is zero Yeah, 50, so I got that equation here. 52 is equal to 1 half t squared. <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. I got this equation. I feel good about that. Um, but I have two unknowns here, so I need one more unknown. Or, what? sorry, one more equation which is, I think, what Bira Benzina is getting at. Um, H 
kt equals 21. Oh. Oh. A times T is 21. So A times T Well, shouldn't this actually be negative 21? Nice. Okay. So then uh, I guess then this means 52 is equal to um, 1 half times negative 21t plus 21t, which is equal to 10.5t. Um, Um, so T is equal to 52 divided by 10.5. And then once I know that, I can just stick that into here. So then acceleration A is equal to um, negative 21 times 10.5 divided by 52. I really have no idea. But let me see. Negative 21 times 10.5 divided by 52. Negative 4.24. I don't know. Negative 4.24. I don't have to think about sig figs because negative four point two four zero three eight and so, etc. I'm still uncomfortable with this whole thing, but okay, we got it. A dog is walking to the right at one point five meters per second and spies a cat ahead and begins chasing the cat with a constant acceleration of 12 meters per second squared. What is the velocity of the dog? Um, oh, so Tyrion asked the question, how to use Hummer, Hummer the, to prove the ra series ratio test, but I have to go for my walk before sundown. I think, well, so I don't know what Hummer is. I, I would imagine you mean the mathematician Kuma or Kummer, if you want to be grotesque about it, vulgar about it, you go right ahead. Um, how to use it to prove the ratio test. I'm not really sure. I couldn't even tell you what Kumar, yeah, Kumar, yeah. I'm not even sure what Kumar's theorem is. I'm sorry. It sounds like analysis. 
A dog walking to the right. Okay, that's this way. Walk at uh, 1.5 meters per second, okay? And begins chasing the cat with a constant acceleration of 12 meters per second squared. What is the velocity after running for three meters? It's doing it to me again, where it's making me um, think about velocities in terms of uh, distances. Or, uh, like, I'd rather they just give me the time, right? That would be nice. Instead, they're going to make me do this thing again. Okay, so um, three is equal to one half one half twelve t squared plus uh, what is its final velocity? Well, that's what we want to know. V sub f t. And then uh, we need to have the expression which relates the acceleration of the dog So the final acceleration of the dog is, or sorry, the final velocity of the dog, Vf. Vf is going to be equal to the acceleration of the dog times time plus its initial velocity, which in this case is 12 meters per second squared multiplied by whatever the time is plus v naught which is 1.5 what do you think do y'all approve there must be an easier way of doing this right Okay, so now it's the hardest part for me. 3 is equal to 6t squared plus 12t plus 1.5 times t. So this feels like 18t squared plus 1.5t time equals times 3. Do I really have to solve a quadratic? hurting my feelings. Right, because what I want, what I'm looking for is t, because then I get the final velocity. Or wait, if I could solve for 12t plus 1.5t, no, there's no way of doing that. All right, uh, Desmos, I need your powers. Desmos. So 18t squared plus 1.5t minus 3. Point three six nine sixty nine point three sixty nine. So then, um, will this do this for me? 
0.369 times 12 plus 1.5. 5.928. Uh oh. 5.928. So is VF equal to 5.928 meters per second? And what does sig figs mean? What, so is this 5.93? Is that what it means? Does sig figs mean rounding? <laughs> I don't know. It's 5.93. What is it? I have no idea. Am I, do I just drop, lop it off? What do I do? Okay. Uh, rounding. You say it's rounding. Okay. I hope you're right. Wait, what? Not quite yet. It, did that mean I didn't get it right? Uh oh. Not quite. Okay. Uh, so I messed up. Where did I mess up? One half a t squared plus. Wait, why did I think it was V F T? I think I messed up here. No? Shouldn't this be V not T? So if this is V not T, then, um, wait, no, wait, what? So then this should allow me to solve for T and then I can figure out it from here because this is still correct this one is still correct so I can use just this guy to figure out what t is okay so yeah so th this becomes 3 is equal to um, 6 t squared plus 1.5 t well that looks a lot more pleasant but it does mean I got it wrong. Minus three. So now we get 0.593 and 0.593 times 12 is 8.616. So I'm gonna go 8.62 now. Oh my god, okay. There we go. I messed up because I put VF there for some reason. Like a doof. A child blows a leaf straight up in the air. The leaf reaches 1.0 meters higher than its original height with a constant acceleration of 1.0 meters per second upward. Or second squared upward. What's up, FFS Rooster? Yeah, of course. So XF is equal to one half A T squared plus V naught T plus um, X naught. So 
the final position of this thing is 1. The acceleration is 1. The initial velocity is, I guess, 0. And its initial position is, I guess, 0. x naught is 0, v naught is 0. So am I crazy in thinking that this is equal to, um, that t squared is equal to 2? What the f OK, fine. Um, and so this is 1.4, 1. 1. I think it's 1.41. 1. Who's with me? I think, because I think that's, square root of 2 up to 2 sig figs. <laughs> All right. A baboon steals an apple and runs to a nearby boulder 10 meters to its left. Over there. The, bab the baboon reaches the boulder in one second with a constant acceleration of tw 20 meters per second squared leftward. What was the bab... Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Let's take a look at what we've got here. Real math. Not math about baboons, which is what physics evidently is. Physics is just math about baboons stealing apples. I think this is the conclusion we can draw. Okay. Um, stream manager. Um. Where, where, what, what, what was FS? I'm fine, all fine as far as the blue box. Okay. So, uh, it is helpful to note that it can be written. So this is a sum of cosines and sines. And I guess the point is that it can be written as a sign of something. And you're going to exploit some trigonometric identity. To see why this works, expand the right-hand side of equation 29. Then compare equation 18. We, uh, we see that 29 is valid, provided that c is equal to a sine psi and d is equal to a cosine psi. Squaring and adding. Okay. In equation 31, We've chosen the positive square root for a. This involves no loss of generality because sine of omega t plus pi is equal to negative sine of omega t. So increasing the value of psi by pi is equivalent to reversing the sine of a. Value, uh, values of psi that differ by an integer multiple of 2 pi correspond to the same motion so we can restrict psi to a range such as psi between 0 and 2 pi. It's just the solution to a damped harmonic oscillator. OK. Well, actually, this doesn't feel damped. This feels like uh, undamped, no? Because in particular, if we saw a damped, uh, if we saw damping here, we would see a decrease in the amplitude with time. Well, 
why do they talk about the positive square root only? Um, so remember that it here a and psi. It, it so when they rewrite x. Okay, so look at x of t in equation eighteen. Do you see how there are two arbitrary constants c and d? Totally arbitrary, right? Now, when if we're going to rewrite this, which we do in equation 29, we should still have two arbitrary constants. In this case, the two arbitrary constants are a and psi. In other words, like you can choose a and psi however you like. I believe this is the point that they're trying to make. And so we might as well because we have two pi periodicity, we may as well restrict psi to be between 0 and 2 pi, just, just as a convention. Because if we were to, for example, adjust psi by adding a multiple of 2 pi, that would correspond to the same solution. Does that make sense? I think that's what's going on here. And like you might get worried that, well, how come I could choose C and D with complete impunity up here? But it feels like now we're going to bound psi in this fancy way. I guess it maybe comes down to, to this equation here. I'm not quite sure. Because tangent of psi can take on any real number value, right? Something along these lines. Anyway. Hopefully that answers your question. And we can get back to baboon math, AKA physics. Why did I have physics envy again? Like, I don't care about baboons. I hardly think about baboons ever. And certainly not miscreant baboons that steal apples. Where does negative square root disappeared to? In equation 31, we have chosen the negative, the, sorry, the positive square root for a. This involves no loss of generality because sine of omega t plus pi is equal to um, negative sine of omega t. So increase the value of, of, of psi by pi is equivalent to reversing the sine of a. Well, because if you stick to a psi between 0 and 2 pi and you want to see the negative root instead of the positive root, what this is saying is you can just add pi to psi. Oh, yeah. Is this not psi? This is psi, this symbol, right? It's not phi, right? Or phi. Phi is not okay. F phi. It's not phi. This is psi, right? What? That's phi? Oh, okay, fine. Whatever. Phi. It's phi. Okay, fine. You're right. It the size like the ten, uh, the trident, the trident. Oh yeah, varfi. What the fuck is varfi then? 
<laughs> okay, never mind. Doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, this is Psy. Awesome. Back to baboon math. Um, what's happening? A baboon steals an apple and runs to a nearby boulder 10 meters to its left. Now, see, this is a great problem. It really demonstrates the differences between math and physics because physics is about the real world. You see how this is like a real world problem? This is about baboons stealing apples. It's a real world problem. Contrast that with math people with their heads in the clouds. Head in the cloud mathematicians. It's no wonder that students are constantly asking, what is this good for? This is where the mathematics meets reality. You see, this is where math meets reality. We got a baboon acting up, stealing an apple and running to a nearby boulder. Okay. This is the real world. It's gritty. Okay. This is not mere mathematical masturbation. No, no. This is like understanding our universe. Um, a baboon steals an apple and runs to a nearby boulder 10 meters to its left. To its left. That sure looks like it's okay, whatever. The baboon reaches the boulder in one second. I have to put myself in the mind of the baboon. I, I'm like, I am the baboon in this scenario. Um, the baboon reaches the boulder in one second with a constant acceleration of 20 meters per second leftward. What was the initial velocity? of the baboon when it started running to the boulder. Rightward positive. Okay. Good question. Very important question. So, um, 10.0 is the initial or the final position of that baboon and this is equal to one half times its acceleration which is 20 meters per second squared multiplied by t squared t is one so we get one squared plus the initial velocity v naught multiplied by one plus the initial position which we're just going to declare is zero Okay, so I think all I need to do is solve this very basic equation for V naught. So this 10 is equal to 10 plus V naught. So is V naught zero? Level up to familiar. I'm a familiar now. This is pagan. Okay. A swimmer is swimming to the left with a speed of 1.0 meters per second when she starts to speed up with constant acceleration. Again. Again. We see here. You know. 
physics truly what what do they have an the emperor of all sciences of all human knowledge physics a swimmer is swimming to the left with a speed of 1.0 meters per second when she starts to speed up with constant acceleration. The swimmer reaches a, f a final speed of 2.5 meters per second over a distance of 5 meters. How long did the swimmer take to speed up to 2.5 meters per second? Well, again, we are going to use that one equation. I has it. Okay, I'll write it again. X, the final position of the dude, is one half times the acceleration times the time it took squared, plus the initial velocity times time, plus the initial position. In this case, A, the acceleration, oh, we don't know it. We know only that it is A um, times T squared. Oh, that, that's what we're hunting for, plus V naught T. So the initial velocity is 1.0 to the left. Oh my God, it's 1.0 to the left negative one times t plus its initial her initial position which is zero and oh of course the final position is five so now we need to know the acceleration or at least we need another um we need another uh, equation So what we know is that acceleration, or uh, the, her final velocity, the other thing we can use is the final velocity is equal to acceleration times time plus initial velocity, right? Her final velocity is 2.5. Fuck me, it's negative 2.5. Wait, is this negative 5 then? This is making me mad. I guess this is negative 5, huh? This is negative 2.5. I should have made the left positive. Really? I don't know what's happening. Somebody yell at me real fast, okay? Plus negative 1. So negative 1.5 is equal to AT. So then now I'm going to shove this into here. And what comes out? Negative 5 is equal to 1 half times at we said is negative 1.5 times t minus 1 minus t rather oh here's a pro tip for everybody out there um do you write your t's like this then you should go to hell okay never write your t's like this you know why 
because it looks like one, it looks like a crucifix, but two, it also looks like a plus sign. So don't do that. Okay, this, uh, Oh yeah, people do this so often. And then they'll write also, okay, here's another one. Here's another tip. Here's another tip. Maybe you write your lowercase u's like that. And maybe you write your v's like that. They are indistinguishable. Here's U, and here's V, okay? All right, all right. I think I've made my point. So what is this? Good God, is this negative 1.75? Oh yeah, Z. Z's like that in math. Okay, Z is like that in math. There is no choice. This is two. That's a problem. <laughs> Omega's kind of got, you know, Oh, Omega's got a fat ass. That's what's happening. Here's Omega. And here's W. Uh, I, do I even write W ever? I'm not sure if I ever write W. This feels weird to me. Maybe I do do that. Hi. My name is Wallace. I think I do do that. Okay, never mind. You know, the other thing that happens is um, I do write like this in English. If I'm writing an English T, then this, I think. Um, but I would never write my, actually, I would never write my name like this. This is my name. But like if I'm in the, if I'm writing, um, uh, what, how, how, his car is over there. Look at that. See, there's the normal T. This is okay. Nobody's going to confuse that for a plus sign or a crucifix, right? But this is ungodly. And if you are doing, hey, young people out there, Word of advice, young people. Don't do this anymore. Just put a little curly Q on it. There it is. Now that's a good looking T. Oh my God. <laughs> I don't know how common Tayo is. Um, We've gone over this before. My mom was a hippie. Tayo means sun, like sun in the sky. So um, just ask yourself, how many people do you see around named sun? Not very many. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think it's that common, bottom line. There are a few other Tayo Inuais in this world. Yeah, sunny is a thing. True, that's true. But sun, I've not really heard of that. I'm not, I, I like my name. I'm fine with it. But um, yeah, it, I, I, and I don't mind that it means, I think the sun is cool. What the fuck? The sun is awesome. So I'm proud to be named after the sun. So listen, um, I 
I don't know what 5 divided by 1.75 is. Python says 2.857. But they, um, but, but, um, they only want two significant digits. Don't really know what that means, but I'm going to guess that what they're looking for, I hope, is 2.86. Does this sound plausible? I don't know. This sounds a little low. Because they're start well, they're starting out with the speed and then it's increasing linearly. Nice. Gold star. We did it. Whatever. Why well, I don't remember. Did we mess up the baboon problem? I don't remember. Oh, no, no, no. That was when I put in um, VF when I should have put it at V naught. I will never make that mistake again, okay? All right. So let's see. What do I do now? Do I have to do this? I uh, am not the right person to talk to about sig figs. It's no secret here. There's no secret here. All right, all right, all right, all right. A motorcycle begins at rest and accelerates uniformly at 7.9 meters per second squared. We want to find the time that it takes for the motorcycle to reach a big velocity, kilometers per hour. What kinematic formula would be most useful to solve for the target unknown? Look at all these kinematic formulas. the time that it takes. Oh, it would of course be A, right? Um, we know V naught, we know V, or yeah, and we know A, so sure. A car is traveling to the right with a speed of 29 meters per second when the rider slams on the accelerator to pass another car. The car passes in 110 meters with, a co with constant acceleration and reaches a final speed of 20 34 meters per second. What was the acceleration of the car as it sped up? So I feel like if I just know these two equations, just just the the um, like there are a lot of other equations that they had on that on that multiple choice, but um, I was not fully confident about all of them. But uh, let's see. So for this guy, let's write what we know. Ladies and gerbils, a good first step when attacking a problem 
that maybe you don't know how to solve is to just write all the information down. For example, a car is traveling to the right with a speed of 29 meters per second. So I guess that means that V naught is 29 meters per second. The rider slams on the accelerator to pass another car. The car passes at 110 meters with constant acceleration and reaches a speed of 34 meters per second. So VF is equal to 34 meters per second. We also know that this acceleration, well, we're going to call the initial position zero, and we're going to call the final position of this car 110. So now can we, from this information, figure out what A is? I'm not smart enough to know that formula. Uh, I think we can, because we know that XF is equal to one half a t squared plus v naught um, t plus x naught, right? We know x naught, we know v naught, we're looking for a. We don't know t though. But you know, um, uh, we can write down another equation which relates acceleration and time with initial and final velocities. Right, VF, yeah, is equal to AT plus V naught. We know that, right? Oh, a math question. S. Cedar 2020 is asking a question. Let's get this garbage. I mean, this physics. I mean, this thing. Um, tickets for a concert? No, please don't apologize. Thank you for butting in. I mean, you're not butting in. Thank you for asking your question. Tickets for a concert are available at two prices. The more expensive ticket is $30 more than the cheaper one. Find the cost of each type of ticket. If a group can buy 10 more of the cheaper tickets than the expensive ones for $1,800. Okay, so let's call the two prices of the tickets X and Y. Or let's call X the price of the cheaper ticket. Can we do that? And can we write for Y, let's make Y the price of the uh, expensive ver tipic ticket. <laughs> the price of the expensive ticket. So we're told that the expensive ticket is $30 more than the cheaper one. Can we translate that English sentence into a mathematical equation involving x and y. How would we do that? Yeah, so Sword Gear, you can upload it to like Imgur, or you could also go onto the Discord and post it there. Either way works well. So S. Cedar, let me ask again. Can you uh, translate the fact that the more expensive ticket is $30 more than the cheaper one? Can you translate that into an equation involving X and Y? Oh, okay. So what that would say is that the cheaper one is equal to 30 plus the, yeah, Y equals 30 plus X. I like that. So Y is equal to 30 plus X. That's, that's good, or big X I was using. All right, cool. 
find the cost of each type of ticket. If a group can buy 10 more of the cheaper tickets than the expensive ones for $1,800. So, how can we say this? So, this group can buy 10 more of the cheaper tickets than the expensive ones for $1,800. So, it sounds like we've got a new variable that we need to keep track of here, which is the number of, let's say the number of cheaper tickets. Let's let N equal the number of cheaper tickets. Uh, oh, sorry, that, that can be bought. for 1800 USD. So if N is the number of cheaper tickets that can be bought, then what do we know? So each of the cheaper tickets costs X dollars. We're buying N of them. So what do we get to, what is a mathematical statement that we can write down? S Cedar. What is an equation that we can write down to reflect that statement? Yes, exactly right. We buy N tickets at X dollars per ticket and it costs 1800 so I guess NX is equal to 1800 exactly right. Now, on the other hand, we can buy 10 more of the cheaper tickets than the expensive ones. So if we can buy N of the cheaper tickets for 1800 how many of the more expensive ones can we buy? Is there an expression that we can write down for the number of more expensive tickets that we can write down? Or sorry, that we can buy for 1800 So like imagine N was 100. I don't know what it is. But imagine N was 100. Yeah, I'm not sure where that came from, S. Cedar. Um, so we can buy 10, can you, so can you answer this question? If I can buy N of the cheaper tickets for 1800, but I can buy 10 more of the more, I, but I can buy, <laughs> 10 more cheaper tickets than expensive tickets. How many expensive tickets can I buy for 1800? How many expensive tickets can I buy? I can buy N cheaper tickets. How many expensive tickets can I buy? No. So imagine N is 100. Imagine N is 100. So I can buy 100 cheaper tickets for 1800. I am told that I can buy 10 more cheaper tickets than expensive tickets for the same money. So if N is 100, how many more expensive tickets can I buy? So uh, let me write. I'm going to leave this blank. And what I want to write here is the number of expensive tickets. 
that can be bought for eighteen hundred dollars yeah I was scared to do that because I didn't want to introduce yet another variable this is already yucky looking so if I can buy again and cheaper tickets how many expensive tickets can I buy No, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to write it down. And then I'm going to ask, do you understand? It's what Lopo Capa Blanca said. It's N minus 10. If we can buy N cheaper tickets, and we can buy... 10 more cheaper tickets than expensive tickets, then the number of expensive tickets is n minus 10. Tell me how that makes you feel. But you agree at this stage, right? Don't feel stupid. You agree at this step, right? Yeah, good. Okay, so on the one hand, we know n times x is equal to 1800. What can we learn using this factoid? We can learn that n minus 10, which is the number of expensive tickets, times what equals 1800? No, 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 no. So N minus 10 is the number of expensive tickets. How much is each expensive ticket? How, how much does X? <laughs> Sorry, my brain just did something. <laughs> Stop. Okay, how much does... Uh, my brain, my brain. How much does each expensive ticket cost? I wrote it on here. How much does each expensive ticket cost? Stop. This is a real world application. How much does each expensive ticket cost? Hint. So not plus, we wouldn't do plus here. What we want to do is take the number of expensive tickets and multiply it by the price of each expensive ticket and set that equal to 1800. We want to take the number of expensive tickets that can be bought for 1800, multiply it by the price of an expensive ticket, set that equal to 1800. I'm going to write it down. N minus 10 times Y equals 1800. Does this make sense to you?
Good. So this is the number of expensive tickets. And this is the price of an expensive ticket. So all I'm doing is multiplying the number of tickets by the price. It's exactly what we did up here, exactly analogous. Whereas here, N, big N, was the number of cheaper tickets and X was the price per cheap ticket. Okay. Now, what do we know about Y? Look on the, pe look on the paper. What do we know about Y? What's something that we know about Y? Yeah, it's equal to 30 plus x. So now, now we know n minus 10 times 30 plus x equals 1,800. Um, let's see. So now, hmm. we want to use these two equations somehow to figure out the values of x. Figure out the value of x. So let's see, how can we get that done? Well, one thing that we could do is we could take this equation here and we could solve it for n. If, so listen, we've got these two equations. I'm going to star them. You see these two equations? We want to somehow squeeze these two equations into revealing to us what x is. Because note that if we know x, then we know the price of the cheaper ticket, and therefore, by this formula, we know the price of the more expensive ticket, right? So here's the strategy that I suggest. I suggest that we begin by solving this equation for n. What is n equal to? from this, as per this equation. What is n equal to? n equals what? Hi, the royal nobody. No, I mean equation-wise. I'm not just going to write this up again, but look at this equation. So we, we definitely could do that. Okay. We definitely could do that. But right now I want to get this equation to be a, an equation with just a single variable. Cause right now there are two variables. And that annoys me. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm annoyed. What does oid mean? But I'm annoyed. So what I'm going to do is exploit this first equation to figure out an expression for n that involves only x. Can I do that? Can you help me? What is n equal to? You say it. I don't care what the other people say. I want you to tell, show me that you understand what's happening here. Write it. Yes, exactly right. 1800 over X. All you did was divide by both sides by X. And now we're going to take this factoid 
this relationship between n and x, and we're going to replace this n right here by that expression. And now we're going to expand this out. 3 times 18, is that 54? So we get 54,000 over x, that's this times this, plus this times that, which is 1,800, minus 300, minus 10x. Does that feel good? equals 1800. Are there any questions how I went from there to there? We see an 1800 over here, which annihilates and is annihilated by the 1800 over there. And then what we can do is multiply both sides of this equation by x. Now I'm just going to say this. Your heart should beat a little bit faster when you multiply both sides by something which could possibly be zero. Now x, of course, is the price of a cheaper ticket. We wouldn't expect x to be zero. It's going to have some positive price, we assume. So probably it's okay for us to multiply by x, both sides by x. But in general, you want to you you want to feel your heart race a little bit more when you do such a a, a move because you need to check your ass. You need to make sure that you're not multiplying both sides of your equation by zero. That's the end of what I'll say about that. Okay. In any case, what we're going to do from here is multiply both sides by x. Can we do that? So what we end up getting is, well, of course, the point is that 54,000 divided by x times x is 54,000. Minus 300, remember we multiply by x, minus 10x squared equals zero. And now we have a quadratic in front of our face. Yeah, and if you move shit over to the um, uh, other side, then you 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 get that thing there. Now, I would suggest that you divide everything in sight by negative 10 because that negative 10 there is fucking annoying. Again, it's an, I'm annoyed. And so this ends up being um, x squared plus 30x minus 5,400 equals zero. And from here, hopefully you can find x. You're welcome. All right, you too. Thanks for the question. Another satisfied customer. Hello there. If anybody out there has any questions about math, oh, is that me? Is that for me, that Imgur? <laughs> right. Okay, sword gear. I'm looking at your problem. Another satisfied customer. I'm looking at your problem. Uh, I'm going to put it, in fact, in our handy dandy Firefox so that everybody can look at it. Oh, what happened? Huh? Wait, what? Why can't I scroll down? What the? Show without integrating. 
that an antiderivative of Wait, what? Oh, so so we want to show that we want to show that big F So we we want to show that big F of x equals which is equal to the log is that the cube root of 2x minus 1 is an antiderivative of f of x, small f of x. That? Do you like it? Oh, you can't read anything I wrote. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. There we go. Is this what we want to show? Okay. So, what did you try? First of all, do you understand what antiderivatives are? What does it mean for big F to be a antiderivative of small f? What does it mean for big F to be as antiderivative as small f? It means something. It really does. But what? Um, kind of. So let's go over the definition real fast, okay? Because it's very simple. Definition. Big F of X is an antiderivative of small F of X if, very simply, the derivative of the big guy is the small guy. Yeah, this is the definition. So, if we want to apply that definition to here, and we want to show that big F is an antiderivative small f, what we should do is take the derivative of this. Does that feel good? We're going to take the derivative of this. So we need to compute f, big F prime of x. Now, yeah, let me actually kill the Firefox because we don't need it any longer. There you go. Okay. Um, do you know how to take, or would you know how to take f prime of x? So now things get hard. Okay, good. Um, I'll suggest, well, I'll suggest two things maybe. The first thing is that you could use the, is well, you're gonna have to do this either way. You're gonna have to use the chain rule. Are you comfortable with the chain rule? Or do you hate it? I forget whether you hate it. Are you comfortable with it? Kinda, yeah. 
here's how I think about the chain rule, okay? You see all the sh the guts, <laughs> the guts of this log. The guts of this log I call like blah or whatever. You know, you can call it whatever you want. And what the chain rule says is that if you want to take the derivative of like for example log of blah with but with respect to x if you want to take the derivative of log of blah with respect to x then you take the deriv derivative of log of blah first with respect to blah and then multiply your answer by the derivative of blah with respect to x did you hear what i said did that make sense To take the derivative of log of blah with respect to x, we're going to first take the derivative of log of blah with respect to blah, then take the derivative of blah with respect to x. So you mean 3 times 2, for example. I don't know. Is that what I mean? I mean multiplication, for sure. I'm not sure that's what you mean to write there. The derivative of log of blah with respect to x is the derivative of log of blah with respect to blah multiplied by the derivative of blah with respect to x. df d blah is e times d blah dx. Yeah. So let's see this in action then, okay? All right, fuck D. Don't worry about don't worry about D for right now, okay? Um let's just take the derivative of this. Let's let's do it. First first play is we're going to pretend, okay, that all of the complications of this gut are go away, okay? And suppose that you are just asked, what is the derivative of log of blah? Well, you probably know that that's 1 over blah, right? 1 over blah. Blah here, of course, is this complicated thing, like that. So we're, this is what we get thus far. Sorry, this is confusing looking. We comfortable so far? And then... We are going to multiply this by the derivative of blah. So we, this is not the right answer on its own. We have to adjust our answer. We, what we, the way that we do that is by taking the derivative of blah with respect to x. So in other words, we're going to multiply this by the cube root of 2x minus 1. We're going to take the derivative of it. That's what that dumb thing there means. We're going to take the derivative of this. Are you comfy with that? I mean, we're not done, but are you comfort comfy with at least that? This was the chain rule. One of the most important things that you will learn in Calc 1. No kidding, no kidding, no exaggeration. Yeah, it's incredibly important. Yes, it would be simpler. That was the other thing I was going to suggest. But, uh, no, chain rule. All right, now listen. How are we going to kill this guy? That is to say, how are we going to compute the derivative of the cube root of 2x minus 1? Well, it's like the cube root of blah again. No, fuck another rule. There's another chain rule here, okay? There's another chain rule that we can do. Because this is like cube root of blah. Are 
Are you with me? Okay, and if I tell you that something, if we have the cube root of blah, and we want to take the derivative of this with respect to blah, how do we do that? Do you know how to take the, the derivative of the cube root of something? Listen to Jink left. Listen to Jink left. Turn the cube root into a power. Do you know how to do that? Does this look familiar? Blah to the one third power. Oh yeah, oh yes. <laughs> and what's the derivative of blah to the one third power? You probably know that this is one third blah to the negative two thirds power. One third before two x minus. Okay, so you're thinking down here, right? You're going down here. All right, let's let's look here. That's okay. Whatever. So now we're going to apply the chain rule again. We're going to take the derivative of the cube root of blah. This time blah is two x minus one. The derivative of the cube root of blah here is one third. Um, blah to the negative two thirds. So two X minus one to the negative two thirds power, right? Right? So do you like this? Do you like this? Does this make you happy as written? Yes, very good. Thank you. There's definitely something missing because what the chain rule says is that we have to now take we have to adjust this answer by the derivative of blah, which is 2x minus 1, which you know is 2. Exactly. Exactly. So this is equal to 1 over uh, 2 oh, uh, so thirds. How do I, how should I write? Well, okay, let me just do it this way. So the two there will get married with the one third there and become a two thirds. And then here we have um, two X minus one to the negative two thirds power, right? You see what I did in going from this line to this line? Why do they get married? So this is two. This is equal to two. And two times one third is two thirds. Another factoid you should know. How can we rewrite 2x minus 1 to the negative 2 thirds, but with a positive power? You see this? I don't know about you, but I'm annoyed by the negative sign right there. How to fix it? For free? Can I just bring it down to the denominator just like that? 
What's the cost? Can I bring it down? I mean, I can. But I know the cost. Do you know the cost? What is the cost of moving 2x minus 1 to the negative 2 thirds down into the denominator? No, this has nothing to do with logs, okay? Nothing to do with logs right now. We've, we've moved on from logs. Now we're just manipulating this expression. So now it's just algebra time. So what I'm asking, again, is everybody, you, you seem to be saying, I can move this expression down into the denominator. That's what you seem to be saying. And you know what? I agree with you. But there is a cost to doing so. Do you know what that cost is? Yeah, Jinklef has the right idea. You can bring this down into the denominator at the cost of a negative sign in the exponent. No, not your firstborn. 1 over the cube root of 2x minus 1 times... Oh, and I'm going to put the 2 thirds out front. You know why? Because I like it there. That's why. And then this is going to become 1 over 2x minus 1 to the positive 2 thirds power. We flip this thing into a denominator at the cost of applying another negative sign to the power. This is true in general. 1 over x to the a is equal to x to the negative a. You must know this. You must be very, very comfortable with this. We can talk about why that's so if you want to, but this is an algebraic factoid that you need to have installed in your brain and have it available to you 24-7, 365. Three sixty six if it's a leap year. All right, so finally, one last play. Can I marry these two terms, these two factors? Is there a way of me uh, of combining them into a single factor? No, no, no. Okay, no. I'm so glad that you said that. I'm so glad that you said that. Okay? Common denominators do not happen, do not need to happen when you're doing multiplication or division. Okay? Don't do that to yourself. You just multiply straight across. Now, I'm asking. Sure, 1 times 1 is 1. We all know that. No sweat. But can you tell me what the product of these two denominators is? What is the cube root of 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1 to the 2 thirds power? Okay. So the exponents are not the same, but you know what is the same? The base, the basis, the sorry, the base rather of these expressions. It's 2x minus 1 in each case. Because remember, please, and I know you probably realize this, this expression down here, this is a synonym for 2x minus 1 to the one third power, right? So essentially what I'm asking is, what is 2x minus 1 to the one third? times 2x minus 1 to the 2 thirds. What is it? Okay. Say it. I don't know what one means. Am I supposed to 
just say it, please. Help me. Help me help me feel like you understand what's happening. Because I think you do. But you just need to really make it crystal clear to me because I'm like a I'm like a baboon, okay? I just need that reinforcement. That's true. One third plus two thirds equals three thirds. I totally agree. So what? How is that relevant here? I know it is, but can you just help me? Can you just make me feel good? What is the product of these two things? What do you mean it's equal? Do you want me to write that the product of these two things is one? No, no logarithms. No, 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 no. That's way too complicated. This is very, very simple. Here we have 2x minus 1 to the 1 third. Here we have 2x minus 1 to the 2 thirds. I'm asking what's the product of those two expressions. Just to be absolutely clear, I'm asking what's the product of this green box with that green box. You want a hint. Okay, here's your hint. When you multiply two powers of some with some common base, you add the exponents together. It's that base with the exponents added together. So now how is that relevant here? Yeah, 2x minus 1 to the 3 thirds power. Now, what is anything to the first power? That's great, Fredo Kush. I just wanted to hear Sword Gear say it. I needed it for my own self esteem, okay? So it's nothing personal. It's just 2x minus 1. There it is. So this whole thing becomes 2 over. 3, that's the 2 thirds, okay? That's the 2 thirds times, now we learn, 2x minus 1. Do you like it? And now, of course, what does this become? Not quite, but we're basically there. We're basically home free. You know why? I know you can do this last piece. Because look, we can distribute the three, right? We can distribute it. And what do we get? There it is. Which is where they wanted us to end up. You're welcome. Happy to be of help. What you can ask me about later is another way that might have been easier for attacking this problem. Oh yeah, algebra is the number one, the number one thing. Yeah, exactly, using the log rule. So like right at the outset, thinking of this as being one third log of two X minus one. This would have helped a lot because you only have to use chain rule once, whereas here we had to do it twice. 
In fact, it probably would behoove you, that is to say, probably would be a really good idea for you to um, work out what the derivative of this is and do all the simplification until you get to this point. And just in case you're skeptical, no, 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 you really do get to this point uh, by simplifying the derivative of this expression. Yeah, algebra is fiddly. Look at all the little details you have to know and all the things. Like, when can things get married? When is it, uh, yeah, all that kind of stuff. But the more practice that you get with it, the more practice you get with it, the better you're going to get, sword gear. Don't be depressed. Don't let the fuckers get you down, okay? Baboons. So, um, do I know anything about stochastic calculus? No. I think that was another satisfied customer, yes. Favorite polygon? It's a great question. I like pentagons. I like the regular pentagon. I really do. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. God damn. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I'm reasonably familiar with Calc 2. We'll do that in a future stream, okay? I like the idea. What's meant by calc 1 and calc 2? So calc 1 is, in my opinion, typically um, differential calculus, meaning like lots of derivatives, lots of things with basic limits. Um, continuity also is a part of calc 1. But really, the big things are limits, continuity, derivatives. Then maybe you, at the end, maybe you learn about... Um, Antiderivatives, definite integrals, and of course the fundamental theorem of calculus. And then in Calc 2, it's very much about, um, in my experience, applications of definite integrals as well as techniques for computing and integrating. Oh, and maybe also um, Taylor series, power series, things like that, issues of convergence which everybody loves. <laughs> All students love it. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, you're being sarcastic. No, 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 no. There was nothing to tell. That's that that I I think I told the extent of the story to you. He uh gave me an appraising look though. That that was uh that was a thing. Um and my explanation is because he realized that, in fact, I'm an inveterate Kim Gordon fanboy. And so, so uh, just saying, Thurston Moore is the lead singer of, um, or one of the lead singers of Sonic Youth, this uh, American noise rock, experimental rock band from, the New, from New York. Uh, and I saw, I met him at a concert uh, a parquet courts concert in Grass Valley. Um, and he is like, a, I don't want to say a hero exactly, but you know, like I kind of grew up on his music. I've been listening to it since for 25 years now for a very long time, maybe even longer than that. Um, so it was crazy to meet the guy who I'd seen, um, you know, all my life in like magazines or whatever all of that kind of stuff. Oh, no, no, no. Not Thurston and not more. Not those ones. Although I did meet Bill Thurston. I did meet him too. I took a class from him while I was an undergrad. And he brought out Kale. Uh, he said, look, here's Kale. Negative curvature. And I was just like, Phew. it really helped. That was uh, a very important moment for me. Um, but yeah, I met... Uh, I met Thurston Moore at a Parquet Courts concert in Grass Valley. And I said, oh, Thurston, I really love your music. I grew up on it like a total beta. I told, I, and oh, yeah, right. Because this band had played earlier in the night, and they sucked, uh, his new band. 
At least I felt that way. So I probably should have told him that his band sucked. I think that would have been the right thing to do. But instead, I uh, simped out. I was like, your music was meant a lot to me. Um, and then uh, and he's like, cool, man, thanks. And then he walked away. But then, as he was maybe three steps out from me, he turned around and kind of looked at me. And he gave me this appraising look. And I didn't not quite know what to make of it. But later on, I realized it was because, well, I don't know. In my fantasies, it's because... Um, I am a total Kim Gordon fanboy. Uh, Kim Gordon being the other, one of the other singers in uh, in Sonic Youth, and who recently was divorced acrimoniously from Thurston Moore, leading to the breakup of the band. Um, can I imitate the look? It's kind of like. I can't, I can't do it without laughing. Sorry, no. Like, like so. Yeah, so yeah. There it is. Like that. He was, uh, yeah, figuring out what I was about. I'm not from Grass Valley, no. I don't know what the Sturm Louisville equation is he is super tall he is yeah yeah i took a class from bill thurston getting back to math i took a class from him but it wasn't like a serious class <laughs> sorry that's not the right thing to say it was like this class that um was like a bit experimental i would say and it was like a sort of hodgepodge of various geometric concepts um, for undergrads. It didn't go into really, really, really like his serious work or anything like that. But um, I don't know. We like played around with um, polyhedra and kale and that sort of thing. <laughs> and oh, yeah, the postdoc. Oh, sorry, uh, the assistant for that class was um, was a postdoc who was under uh, Thurston's supervision, who's now uh, a professor at Berkeley named Ian Eagle, very famous geometric topologist. Oh man, yeah, see wombat. I read a story about Feynman going down to the cafeteria, eating a bowl of soup, watching a plate spinning on a table for some reason, and being like, I got to understand that. And then he like goes up to his office and he computes the Lagrangian. I'm like, I don't understand how this, how this, I don't. I don't get it. I don't know. I, I don't even know what it is exactly. It's like something you minimize of something called action. I don't know what that is. Like sometimes action is one thing, but sometimes it's something else. And then there's the least action principle, something. These are all words that I've heard before, but never stitched together in the right order. So um, yeah, classical mechanics. It's on the, uh, on the list of things to learn before I die, but mostly so that I can understand a little bit better what's happening um, in other in other physics things. What do I think of the climb bottle guy? Seems nice. He's a very nice guy. I met him. He's in, he uh, lives in Berkeley, and he comes um, to the first day of like of grad school where everybody's like getting to know one. He came and he gave like a, a talk about climb bottles. V.I. Arnold's book, An Introduction to Physics for Mathematicians. Oh, that's cool. I keep hearing about V.I. Arnold and maybe what, I, I don't remember what I've heard about him. Like maybe that he's a really talented expositor. So maybe I should keep track of this. Um, what is a Lie group? 
A Lie group is a smooth manifold with a group structure, um, which is, there's like a compatibility between the manifold structure and the group structure. The compatibility comes in the following form. You can think of it like um, left multiplication uh, by a group element is a um, diffeomorphism. A manifold is a space which, when you zoom in on any particular point, as you increase the magnification more and more, looks more and more like Rn. Sure, probably. I might not be remembering the definition totally right. Um, how do I cope with sadness while being a student? I mean, depression of being conscious of your ignorance. Um, you drink? No, 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 no. That's toxic. Um, um. Curl into a ball. <laughs> Stay warm. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Uh. Crack open a book, but, you know, wait for the tears from your eyes to, um, to, to go away so that you can actually read the text. I mean, like you want to keep the tears in because you don't want your books to get all smudged with your tears. Okay. Uh, um, but do hold them back and wait for, wait, wait until that burden feels a little bit lighter than average. <laughs> oh God. All right. Nice. Um, <laughs> so Vapor X keeps asking questions. Okay. Let's see here. Oh no, it's, it's about work. What am I going to do? This question is about work. The work required to launch an object from the surface of the earth to outer space is given by W equals. Okay. 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 What are A and C? A through C. Strongly suggest that if anybody's having a, one of those mathematical crises of confidence that you don't <laughs> come on Twitch. <laughs> it will merely exacerbate. Find the work required to launch an object in terms of M. So do you mean the um, find the work required to launch the object in terms of M sub two? Okay, so you're going to be integrating, obviously, um, this F. G and M1 sound like constants. Oh, M1 is the mass of the Earth, right? So then the work is the integral from this big R to this infinity of... Um, uh, G, M1 m2 over x squared dx. This is 
relatively easy to do. I assume that we're not doing rocket science here. So M2 is probably just a constant, not depending on anything fancy. So we can just pull all this G M1 M2 crap out of the integral. Oh, the whole point was to pull this out. Sorry. Oh, what? what? <laughs> all right, start over. Um, G M1 M2 integral R infinity one over x squared dx. And uh, now we have to do this integral. So can you tell me, please, an antiderivative for one over x squared? Could you find an antiderivative for one over x squared, please? Because we're gonna use the fundamental theorem of calculus to calculate this uh, definite integral here. Okay, good. So another way of writing this that's maybe more convenient is to write this as g m1 m2 times the integral from r to infinity of x to the negative 2 power dx. Because this puts it into a form where you can apply sort of standard rules about uh, integrals in a straightforward manner. There's something called, for example, the power rule, which maybe you know. Does this help clarify things? Yeah, so what's an antiderivative for x to the negative 2? Just to be absolutely clear, I've done no calculus so far. I've just used algebra to rewrite 1 over x squared as x to the negative 2. Now it's time for us to do some calculus. What is an antiderivative of x to the negative 2? Taylor series equals power rule? Uh, no. The power rule is um, the following statement. Yeah, this might be an American thing. We call the following factoid of the power rule that the integral of x to the r dx is equal to x to the r plus 1 over r plus 1 plus c as long as r is not equal to 1. I mean negative 1. Negative 1 over x. That's good. So an antiderivative of this is uh, negative 1 over x. And this is going to get evaluated from r to infinity. I hope you're all OK with that. Um, Notation. N remember, Vapor, when we use the fundamental theorem of calculus, we do not need um, the, R, the, the full indefinite integral. We just need one antiderivative. Any antiderivative will do. So we might as well make our lives easy, save some ink, and just pick negative 1 over x. Make sense? Okay, so... What happens when you, look at what my stupid fingers are doing. You ready? What happens when you plug in infinity into negative 1 over x? The facial ticks are gone. People are, people are uncomfortable. What happens when you plug in infinity in for x here? <laughs> what do you get? Yeah, what happens when you plug in infinity to negative 1 over x? Okay, let's think about this proper, properly then, all right? Let's think about this properly. What's actually happening here is you're going to replace this infinity with some letter, huh. like, I don't know, B, okay? Replace this infinity with a B, but then out here, we're gonna think about what happens as B goes to infinity. So imagine that you stick B in for negative one over X. You, you, what? you stick B into negative one over X. So you get negative one over B. 
negative one over B. And here's my question, what happens to negative one over B as B goes to infinity? So yeah, I'm just, sure, sure. So I'm asking, what is the limit? All right, you know what, we're gonna do this properly. Yeah, where did we get B from? All right, I need to interpret what I mean by this infinity, okay? I'm gonna interpret what I mean by this infinity as a limit. So in particular, I'm gonna write this as the limit as B goes to infinity of G M1, M2, negative one over X, I'm gonna replace this infinity here by B. What I mean by this is this. We're gonna let this quantity B here, which is just something I made up. I did, it's B, it's not important that it's B in particular. You can use almost any letter and be okay. Don't use X, for example. But um, like you could put a T there if you wanted to, or an alpha, or a psi, it doesn't matter. But the point is that we're gonna let this B run out to infinity. And now my question is, okay, so if we, if we literally do what's on the page, literally do what's on the page, then this is saying, we're gonna take the limit as B goes to infinity of G M1 M2 of negative one over B. So that's me sticking in the top bound. And now I'm gonna stick in the lower bound and I'm gonna subtract. So I get minus negative one over R. How does that make you feel? And now, what happens to B, oh, uh, what? What happens to negative one over B as B goes to infinity? So what am I asking there? Imagine like B starts out at 10, and then is 100, and then is 1,000, and then 1,000, 1,000, and then 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, etc. B is, in other words, getting larger and larger and larger and larger. What is happening to negative one over B? Oh, no, 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 please, please, please. No, 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 stop, stop, stop. Negative one over B, as B gets larger and larger, negative one over B, what happens to it? So, all right, so negative one over B, right? That's what we were looking at? So negative one over, let's just imagine some values for that we can put in for B. Like, let's say 10. Oh, this is going to spit out zero, isn't it? Everybody's so bad at me. I have to type in an extra three at the end. Anyway, so we get negative 0.1, right? When I do negative one over 10, I get negative 0.1. Now, what happens if I increase B, make B 100? So B is larger now. Well, I get 0 0.01. Please note, 0 0.01 is smaller than 0 0.1. What happens if I put in something even larger for B? Well, I get a yet smaller quantity. And we can keep going, of course. Oh, that, that doesn't look good. God, the fuck, why, you ass, okay, they get smaller, these numbers are getting smaller, okay, yeah, the decimal gets smaller as B increases, we can make it even smaller if we do something like this, no, god damn it, okay, whatever, it gets smaller and smaller is my point, as B gets larger and larger and larger, Sibilance, we don't go for that, okay? Just stop. No, stop, stop, stop with the lies. As B gets larger and larger and larger, negative one over B gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Does this feel okay? We could even look at, for example, if you like pictures, we could look at, uh, 
Desmos.com. I'm going to put in y equals uh, negative 1 over b. Okay? And now what I want you to observe is what's happening to the y coordinates of points on this graph as x is getting larger and larger and larger. Can you see how they're getting closer and closer to the x axis? In other words, negative 1 over b for b very large is approximately 0. And in the limit, as b goes to infinity, negative 1 over b is 0. How does that make you feel? So now returning to our calculation, as b goes to infinity, this dies. And so what we are left with in the end is g m1 m2 over, now negative negative 1 over r is, negative minus 1 over r is positive 1 over r. Positive 1 over r times all this garbage is just r. And this is the amount of work then. This is the amount of work. GM, oh yeah, GM you're given in the problem is 4 times 14, 10 to the 14th meters cubed per second squared times M2. And R, we are told, is 6,370 kilometers so now we just have to figure out what this quotient is we have to be a little careful because this is written in terms units of kilometers and these are written in units of uh, well meters cubed per second squared so really probably what we should do is convert this 6370 into meters 6,370 kilometers, we should convert that into meters. And then we can do this division cleanly. Divide 4 times 4, 4 times 10 to the 14th. Divide it by, it'll end up being 6,370,000. Yeah, you got it. And then, uh, and then that will tell you what the work is as a function of M2. You'll know precisely what. Like if you know M2, you know how much work is required to get it into space. Here's y equals x squared. Let's say I wanted to ship this four units to the right. The right being this direction, a positive direction. I could do it. Want to watch? Want to see me do it? I did it. And what is it that I really, what did I really do? I replaced the x here by x minus 4. And that had the effect on the level of graphs of shifting things four units to the right. Now let's say I wanted to further shift this thing, but let's say I wanted to shift it downward by um, uh, two units. Then I can do that. I can subtract two, and I will have shifted this thing, um, shifted the red curve four units to the right, two units downward. Okay, so you like all that, good. Now say I wanted to make this thing skinnier like a skinnier parabola for some reason. Here's what I could do. I could multiply the x, replace the x in the red curve, replace it by, let's say, I don't know, 2x. And I get a skinnier parabola. You good with that? If I wanted a fatter parabola, I could get that.
Oh, okay. So the it when the two go so let's just be clear. In going from the red curve to the blue curve, what I've done is I've replaced the x by 2x, right? And what that's done is that it's horizontally shrunk the graph. Maybe a better example than this is sine of x. Have you seen sine in your life before? Do you know this guy? Very important guy. Oops. Now, if I want to um, compress this by a factor of two, so that instead of taking two pi radians to oscillate to do one full wavelength, yeah, sorry, uh, we could uh, compress it by two. Y equal the way we could do that is like this. So when we replace x by 2x, um, when we replace x by 2x, we compress horizontally. We can also stretch out horizontally if we want to by doing, let's say, 0.5x. Oops, 0.5x. So just to be clear, if you want to see what this looks like, we can do something like this. So you can see that as A varies, A is varying here from negative 10 to 10, but maybe we shouldn't worry about negative right now. Uh, maybe let's make it go from 0 to 10 with a step of 0.1. We can see this um, sine wave why it stretches so it stretches when a is less than one when a is between zero and one the sine wave stretches um so for example uh point point five this is uh this is what we get and it stretches because okay how long does it take for sine of x to do one full cycle it takes two pi radians right it takes x we need two pi two pi worth of x to do one full cycle right Say that you agree with me, please. All right, so now let's think about this guy. Same sign, same function, but now to do one full cycle, okay, listen carefully. To do one full cycle, it takes 0.5x 2 pi to do one full cycle. It takes 0.5x 2 pi to do one full cycle right? So how long does it take x to do one full cycle? Well, we divide 0.5x equals 2 pi. We divide both sides of that by 0 0.5. 0 Let me write down what I was saying. No, no, no. okay. You're bamboozled by the 0.5. I don't, uh, I don't blame you. Decimals suck. There is a good old fraction. I know you love fractions, right? You love fractions. All right, so here's what I'm trying to say. With y equals sine of x, okay, x needs... Uh, 2 pi to do one wavelength. You agree? Hard to disagree. I know you know this. So now let's think about y equals sine of 0.5x, or 1 half x rather. 
sine of one half x. So now the statement looks very similar, but now we know it's one half x needs two pi to do one, ha uh, one wavelength, right? It's one, one half x needs two pi to do one full wavelength. One half x needs that, not x. One half x needs two pi to do one full wavelength. You with me? So what does that say then about x? How much does x need to do one wavelength? It needs four pi. Tell me that you like it. In general, this is important for you to know if you're like, uh, well, it's just important for your life. In general, sine of omega x. Um, what we say is that omega x needs, again, two pi for one wavelength. So what does x need? x needs two pi over omega for one wavelength. Very important that. I'm gonna be real. I get annoyed when people apologize like uh, over and over again for stuff they shouldn't be apologizing for. I think it's a tendency of young people to almost say it thoughtlessly. Um, there you go. Yes, you should be. Thank you for that apology. I appreciate it. <laughs> but yeah, just incessant apologizing. Serious question. How did you study upper division math courses during undergrad? Like, Unlike calc, and linear algebra, I could just grind out problems to improve. I'm having trouble finding a study method that works for the proof-based courses. Right now, my only method of studying is rereading sections to understand the proof and concepts. Um, it was a lot of, uh, for me, I think I, what I, I worked pretty hard in, in under, as an undergrad. And I will say that I have a number of regrets as to the number as to how I did it. So I these are all well worn tropes at this point in this channel, but I don't mind saying them again. So um, one thing that I think um, one thing that I tried to do um, a lot of was uh, well do lots of problems, I guess, trying to do lots of problems. Um, one way that this came up for me, actually, that that's maybe a little bit different from other people is that uh, I used to hang out in a uh, math IRC channel. And so this would just give me like glimpses of sort of the levels above me. You know what I'm saying? Like advanced mathematics that maybe I wasn't totally comfortable with. But at least hearing the words and seeing people talk about it gave me um, some degree of comfort with it. Uh, so I thought that that was, um, I think maybe that was valuable. I think more to the point though, is just studying like kind of what um, people are saying, like just studying lots of examples of proofs, trying really hard to understand the ideas. I don't know, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to really describe in words. Um, the regrets that I mentioned, I, I think are, are the following. I think like, it's really easy to get super hung up on being stuck and not moving on from being stuck. That seems bad, right? Uh, but I would definitely do that to myself where like, I wouldn't understand some simple step. Often the answer was incredibly obvious in hindsight, but I couldn't see it. And it would, it would like haunt me. And I would start to feel like a burning feeling inside of me because like, I know I'm supposed to be able to see this step, but I don't see it and it hurt. So maybe instead of beating myself up about that, 
Um, uh, Nutbuster just joined. Be nice. There was a way to see the queue. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, that's what's that's what's good about um, textbooks. That's what's good about textbooks, okay? Because textbooks hopefully will arrange problems in the right order, so that you know um, when you learn about Lagrange's theorem or something, the exercises might have something to do with Lagrange's theorem. Whereas um, if and, and won't assume something like the other one, the co the partial converse to Lagrange's. Is it Cauchy's theorem? For example. The other thing that you should do, Devil Honor, is make friends and talk about math with friends. Like, take turns acting like a teacher for each other. That sort of thing. I think that's like one of the most powerful things you can do honestly yeah friends i know i know and you know what friends are not are they aren't just good for learning math they're good for your life they they'll make you they'll make you a happier person <laughs> sometimes anyway moving on um yeah that's true you all make a good point. I'm generalizing from my own experience. Experience. True. All of this is true. I know. There's like two strikes. <laughs> That's already two strikes. <laughs> oh, come on. Swing for the fences, okay? Swing for the fences. <laughs> Don't let the fuckers get you down, all right? Exactly. Fuck COVID, all right? Oh, good luck to you, Devil Honor, for sure. I appreciate it. Is there an equation to solve square roots? So like you're asking, if you're given some random ass number, how to find the square root of that number? Um, so there are certainly going to be approximations to... Um, the square root of a number. Um, for example, I, I mean, the one thing that comes to my mind is like the Taylor series. But I'm pretty sure that if I was to, um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that if anybody studies like numerical methods or anything like that, um, I'm pretty sure I get laughed out of the room for suggesting that. Um, don't know for sure, but pretty sure. Okay. Uh, Maybe Newton's method is better. Yeah, the square root of any non-perfect square is indeed irrational. So there might be you might be able to use uh, Newton's method perhaps to solve the problem. Right? If you look at x squared minus a, where a is the number that you want to take the square root of. Can you talk about binary conversion? Like 1011 one, one equals 11. I know the method to do conversion. Okay, I think so. So let's talk about the familiar base 10 first. Base 10 is nice and cozy. We know it well. We've been indoctrinated it from it with it since a long time ago when we were still children. So when I write a number like, um, I don't know, 2,675, here's how we can think about this number. I'm going to think about its individual digits, all right, its digits, 
Um, and what it's equal to is 2 times 10 to the third power plus 6 times 10 to the second power plus 7 times 10 plus 5 times 10 to the first power plus 5 times 10 to the zeroth power, right? In other words, the reason why we say that we're working in base 10 when we write when we typically write down numbers is because we are taking increasing powers of 10 here. And we're parking digits from 0 to 9 in front of these increasing powers of 10. Yeah, so we have this. All right. So now, what if we add a number in base 2, like the example that you gave of 1101? If we write this in base 2, so this is in base 10. Sometimes I think people will, if they really care about this, they'll put like parentheses around and put a little 10 down below. Like they might write something like this. Just to be absolutely clear that this string of digits is to be interpreted in base 10. Similarly, we could write this number and interpret it in base 2. And if we did that, then what number is it? What integer is it? Well, it's 1 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 squared plus 0 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the zeros. How does this work? Well, this one right here, for example, is the same as that one there. This one is the same as that one. This zero here is the same as that zero. And this one is the same as that one. This is the <laughs> this is basically the maximum of my understanding about bases, bases of numbers. I really don't worry about them otherwise. Can I talk about vectors next? This is a very big topic. Um, is there something specific about vectors that you want to know about? Maybe I'll say this. Maybe I'll say this. Vectors are quantities that have a associate. So the usual quantities that you've been um, you've been operating with for most of your life so far are numbers. Okay, parallelogram method. Okay, you've been accustomed to using numbers in your life. Now we need to get a little bit more sophisticated because there are things out there which um, there are quanti there are things out there that we would like to quantify that aren't si aren't summarized by a single number. For example, there are things called forces which have not just a magnitude, not just sort of a intensity, like this being lesser of a force than something like that, but also have a direction. So this being different from that, for example. We would like to be able to distinguish between these things. And vectors are a gadget which you can use to make just such a distinction, okay? So uh, that's the sort of why. There are shitloads of uh, quantities out there that we you model using vectors. There's forces, like I just said, but there's also more boring things like velocities, accelerations. These are all things that you model using vectors. Now, one of the things that all of these things have in common is that there's a way of adding them together, which I think is what you're getting at. And the way that you add them together um, is very important. It's called, I think, the parallelogram law. Um, and it looks like this. If you have two vectors, if you have V and you have W, okay? Okay, so one of the things that you have to come to grips with about vectors in this context 
is that they are, um, they are, you can move them around as much as you want, as long as you don't change their direction and you don't change their magnitude. So in other words, I've drawn here the vector w here. I've drawn it here, but I could equally as well of well, I could equally of well, I could equally as well have drawn it like over here. No, that's terrible. Like over here. This is supposed to be the same vector. Those are supposed to look identical, okay? I could have equally well drawn this vector over here. So in particular, if I have two vectors, v and w, I can move them so that their tails coincide. See, the tails of these vectors are the same point. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, well, I, yeah, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna draw the vector w, I'm gonna move it so that its tail is at the um, head of v. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, there's w, okay? This does not look good. And I can move V so that its tail is on the head of W. And what you're gonna get, if you do this right anyway, is a parallelogram. Okay, that's a parallelogram. W is pointing in the same direction as W, so they're parallel. And V is pointing in the same direction as V, they're also parallel. And they meet up, the heads meet up like this. And then you define the sum of the vectors v and w to be what's come uh, sometimes called the resultant. Is that what it's called? A resultant. Like that. Resultant. This is V plus W. Don't worry if you've never heard that word before. It's just words. What we get when we connect the tail of V to the head of W in this way is a new vector called V plus W. I heard the resultant at some point in my life. Tell me, uh, so, do you like it? So, um, <laughs> it's so, okay. These are just words. So it's like, um, if you think maybe a V as being one force acting on an object, which is com causing, compelling that object to sort of move. You have a force acting on the object, right? It's compelling it to move. But then maybe you have a second force acting on the same object. You can look at the overall, the sort of net force acting on the object. And what that will be is the sum of the two forces in this sense of a uh, 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 vector sum. That's kind of magical. You have some object like this, okay? If you have one force acting like this and another force acting like that, the sum of the two forces will cause it to act like this. Both forces are acting on it, right? Okay, imagine it's like this. You have like a rocket booster here on this side, which causes it to move like that. And you have another rocket booster down below, which causes it to move like that, if fired alone. Now imagine firing both of the rocket boosters at the same time. Then what you're gonna see is the, the object moving like that. Moving with a force equal to the sum of the two forces from each of the uh, rocket boosters. I do, yeah. Um, and I think this is the way most people visualize it. So first of all, start with the, um, 
the two sphere because you can generalize this discussion to the three sphere. So for the two sphere, what you can do is think about stereographic projection. Okay, so um, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe not, That's, either way is fine. What you can do is take a two sphere like this, all right, and put a plane tangent to the sphere at the south pole. All right, so here's that plane. Then there is a bijection. Okay, so yeah. Now imagine putting a light source at the North Pole. Light rays will emanate from that North Pole in all directions. But in particular, some of those light rays are going to um, intersect the sphere at some point, like maybe this light ray right here, I might imagine, intersects this sphere at some point. Now, if we keep following that light ray, that light ray will also intersect the plane at some point. And in this way, if you think about this for doing this process for every single point on the sphere, this process is called stereographic projection, we get a bijection between every point on the plane and almost every point on the sphere. The only point that gets missed, of course, is the North Pole. The North Pole gets missed by this. But other than the North Pole, there is a, a nice continuous bijection between the sphere, oh wow, it's with the sphere and with the, the plane, okay? So we can think about sort of doing this process in reverse of taking the plane and sort of wrapping it around the sphere so that we are missing a, a point at, uh, so, so that the only thing missing on the sphere itself is the point at infinity, uh, sorry, the North Pole. We give a name to that North Pole, we fill it in, we give a name to that North Pole, we call it the point at infinity. And what that gives us is, a, a, in fact, a pretty famous structure, maybe you've heard of it, the Riemann sphere. Yeah, This is what Riemann used to make some complex mappings that look like they're a little bit pathological, make them not look pathological anymore, right? Like Mobius transformations, for example. Um, cool. So this is a way of visualizing the two sphere. It's kind of dumb because we already know about the two sphere and have no problem visualizing it. Take a basketball and just think about the surface or the surface of the earth or whatever. But what you can do is generalize this to three dimensions. So what you can imagine, okay, is taking R3, okay, R3 the points of R3 are going to be the stereographic images of points on S3 other than the quote unquote point at infinity, or maybe if you like the North Pole. And then, um, so you're going to take that R3 and you're going to sort of wrap it around the S3. You're going to miss the North Pole, but then you plug it in. So that the way that most people think about R3 or sorry, excuse me, S3, is they think about R3 with an additional point at infinity. So in particular, if you were living in S3, then, and you were wearing a jetpack, okay, and you were to fly straight up, eventually you pass through that point at infinity, in finite time, you pass through that point at infinity and you emerge from below where you, where you were. Right? And you can fly off in that direction, of course. And in finite time, you'll hit the point on infinity, and then you'll come back from the other side. And that's going to be true no matter what direction you go in, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a, a three torus is the cube with opposite faces identified. That's right. And it's also true that you can fly around in the three torus.
But of course the topology there is different. Yeah, the three the three torus is not the same as the three sphere. That is for sure. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that this is almost always the way that people visualize the three sphere. It's just with as S3, or sorry, R3 with an additional point at infinity. In my algorithm book, it says 50 times 10 to the 7 log 10 to the 7 instructions divided by 10 to the 7 instructions per second is approximately 1163 seconds to complete. <clears throat> but I can't seem to figure out how they got that answer and what I'm doing. So we have 50 times 10 to the seventh log 10 to the seventh divided by 10 to the seventh. So then no. And I don't know what log of 10 to the seventh is. Uh, in particular, is do you know if they're using base two logarithms or base e logarithms or base 10? Certainly not base 10. So maybe it's the natural log of um, 10 to the seven. Maybe it's log base two, I don't know. Eleven sixty two. Yeah. So what they're doing is they're doing log base two, which I guess is the fashion when it comes to um, when it comes to working with logarithms. Sorry, what? Doing logarithms in the context of computer science is uh, you do your logarithms base, in this case, base two. So if you compute 50 times log base two of 10 to the seventh, the three sphere from the inside. So keep in mind that I presume that this description of the three sphere is going to incorporate the geometry. I was kind of doing the same thing, I guess. Uh, but it will not just talk about three, the three sphere topologically, but also um, give a description of it sort of in its, uh, with its uh, uh, spherical geometry. Let's see what it says. Another easily described three manifold is the three sphere. The easiest definition of S3 is the unit sphere. Unfortunately, this formula does not immediately communicate um, a picture of S3 to people who are not adept at visualizing four dimensional space. Um, to prepare the way, first think of what an inha inhabitant of S2, the two sphere would see. By some mechanism, light rays are supposed to curve around to follow the surface. For instance, you can imagine that the surface is really a very thin layer of air between two large concentric glass spheres, which channel light by reflection in much the same way as fiber optics. Well, that's a cool idea. Um, imagine creature A resting at the North Pole and another creature B, another creature another creature B creeping away. You can work out the visual images in terms of which geodesics, which are great circles, from the eyes of A intersect B. As B creeps away, its image as seen by A first grows smaller, although not quite as fast as it would on the plane. That's positive curvature there. Once B reaches the equator, however, its image grows larger again with continued progress until at the South Pole, its image fills up the entire background of the field of vision of A in every direction. 
Does that make sense? So you think about like the set of all great circles passing through the um, North Pole. It's because, okay, so think about like the, pr the proportion of light rays, sorry, of great circles. Think about the proportion of great circles which intersect creature B. As B is walking away, that proportion gets smaller. But when it passes beyond the equator, it starts growing again. And when it's because every single um, no, every single great circle which passes through the North Pole also passes through the South Pole, right? So when the creature reaches the South Pole, it fills up your entire vision. All you see is creature B. No, it's not a point. It's going to have some size. Right. You should imagine it having it. You should imagine it having size. Yeah. Anyway, the same phenomenon would take place in the three sphere. Let's give ourselves some more breathing room than we had in T3 and imagine we are in a three, three spherical world where a great circle is about two miles in circumference. There is no gravity and we won't fuss about food, shelter or light or other minor details just now. We have little jets on our backs for flying around wherever we please. If I fly away from you in any direction, my visual image to you shrinks in size at first fairly rapidly, but as I approach the half mile mark, my visual size changes very slowly. It probably looks to you as though I have stopped making progress. After the half mile mark, I generally start to, excuse me, gradually start to increase in visual size. So the half mile mark um, is sort of an, um, it's sort of analogous to the distance from the North Pole to the um, equator, right? So you're around the equator uh, when you're a half mile, sorry, a no, 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 a half mile away. Um, I gradually start to increase in visual size once more. And as I, I approach your antipode, which is if I'm at the North Pole, it's the South Pole, one mile from you, I start to grow rapidly again. When I am three feet from your antipode, the, si the size of my visual image is exactly the same as if I were three feet away from you. Yeah, that makes sense as well. Um, does it make sense to you? Because it, it, these things are gonna be symmetric. Uh, if you think about, for example, the antipodal map, that should be an isometry. Even though I have the same visual size to you when I hover three feet from your antipode as when I hover three feet from you, there is a difference in my visual image. You see further around to my sides. I don't know what he means by this actually. You see further around to my sides. Okay, so the point of this discussion, I believe, is to discuss the geometric, uh, what we, how we should imagine the geometry of S3. Not so much, not as much the topology of S3. Hi, Skugget. How are you today?
because all this discussion about like light rays and all of that kind of stuff depends on a notion of geometry on uh, S3. So an important thing to understand, there are sort of two layers here that we need to be, or two sort of levels that we can discuss these spaces at. We can discuss them topologically or we can discuss them geometrically. Oof. All right. Well, drink lots of water. Okay, Skugget. Um, and of course, uh, and so w the perspective here, I think, is that we have a sense of maybe what geometrically, or sorry, topologically, S3, S3 is. Um, but here we're really elucidating the geometry when we put on the standard spherical geometry on this space. And uh, he's giving us a visual tour. What are some core concepts that should be focused on that give a solid understanding of mathematics among various subfields? Uh, I think that calculus and linear algebra are really good for that purpose, perhaps. Um, maybe also something like, uh, you know, set theory, perhaps. Some really basic stuff, though. Hopefully you get at least some of that in your in a linear algebra class. Um, but yeah, you'll want familiarity with those if, for example, you go into like, I mean, like linear algebra and calculus are sort of used everywhere in many different fields, I would say. Maybe linear algebra even more so than calculus, to be honest. But like, uh, like if you ever want to study geometry, differential geometry or something like that, then certainly both of those would be very helpful to know. Um, Like it's as at a certain point also, these I the sort of pillars of mathematics become other things as well, like group theory or sorry uh, abstract algebra I should say becomes definitely something that you uh, build a whole lot of knowledge off of, and where um, it's almost like an assumption that you know at least the rudiments of a lot of abstract algebra. I guess analysis plays the same role. <laughs> yeah, we're doing Khan Academy physics. I don't know why we're doing it exactly. I think it's just so people can make fun of me, which is fine. We like that. In any case. I don't know, I'm tired of thinking about it. All right. I'm full purple on two of these. Full purple. How purple are you? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Look, a uh, man with a, a rectangle with a Lego hat is so happy for me. Unit test. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can handle this right now.
We'll do it tomorrow, okay? Oh, no, not tomorrow. You know why not tomorrow? Because I'm not streaming tomorrow, I don't think. Um, Mondays are always weird for me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, no, we're all about them go green check marks and gold stars. I noticed that the gold star is in uh is more commonly used on this site. I think that's unfortunate. I strongly prefer the green check mark. How do you all feel? Green I can really get off on the green check mark. The gold star is a little gaudy. What do you think? It's a little ugh. I don't I don't like it. Green check mark though. That really, really gets me going. All right, tomorrow we're gonna do the unit test. We we have, to, you know, it's good practice when you when you've blasted your brain with information. It's good practice to just sort of sleep on it, and let your mind process it, right? Although, frankly, I think I've only learned two things in this entire, in this entire, thing. First, I've only needed two things, rather. I've only needed to know that XF is equal to 1 half AT squared plus V naught T plus X naught. And the other thing that I needed was V sub F is equal to AT plus V naught. Easy. Okay, so... um. I'm not sure how much I really need to sleep on it, but let's play it safe, okay? Because right now I'm going to be killing the stream. I love you all very much. It's been very fun uh, hanging out and all of that. Um, let's raid a person. How about Laboratory 424? Uh, let's see if we can get a screw got there. ping pong balls going over there. Uh, uh, yeah, it is slow, I know. I hope to see you Don't all yeah, on a future stream. Like I'm not going to awesome. be streaming tomorrow. At least I don't think so. I might get a wild hair up my uh, ass and, and do it anyway. But no guarantees on that one. Too, as as um, but we will drop, definitely be back dark, on Tuesday. Yes. Yeah, love you all. Um, have a great rest of your evening, yes. okay? Um, so, yeah, I'll do that. I'll soon. do the calibration. Peace out, y'all. And then right. we're probably good to go. And say hi to this, uh, have to this the bit size. Bill Nye looking fucker. All right. Get another half love you. On Bye. It. Yeah, I usually do all metric when I do printing and stuff. For laser cuts, uh, it's, I'm using, I'll use uh, standard because the uh, cutter is calibrated to that. But. Uh, the uh, Tayo, hey, how you doing, my friend? <laughs> we have super smart math people in there. Oh, good. How are you? Thank.